coming up on this episode of Belief Hole. These stories are awesome because they're living witnesses that experience the death of somebody, sometimes multiple family members in the same room, expecting nothing to happen, Mm -hmm. and then experiencing what the dying person is experiencing, some of them leaving their own bodies with this person for a moment. A shared near-death experience because they happen to be in that room. What that means, who knows? 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 There are people that make the argument that the traumatic realization that you're about to die can elicit premature evacuation. (laughs) (laughs) The idea that you would leave your body because you see your imminent doom. That's an interesting concept though. Just the awareness, the hyper realization that you might die. Mm -hmm. There's periods of leaving the body before death. And the thing about these experiences is that they're ephemeral or hard to describe. It's like one of these things where you can explain what it was like, but you can't describe it exactly. I mean, that's super common in these experiences, but it's the idea of the same thing, the tunnel, the threshold, Mm -hmm. the cave, the well. It's always sort of an entrance way. It's that bridge. Right. It's kind of like it opens up a portal almost. Yeah, exactly. This was observed by Professor Bruce Green. He had uh, interviewed people from like in the 80s, and then 40 years later, he interviewed them again, and he remarked that their memories of the NDEs, the near-death experience, way clearer than any other memory from that time and unchanging. Exactly, yeah. The stories don't change. The stories don't change. The stories don't change. I think it's important to consider the fact that before the 1960s, no one really talked about this stuff. These common shared experiences of people dying, seeing loved ones, a tunnel of light, hearing beautiful music. And it wasn't until Dr. Raymond Moody, who was a psychologist and a philosopher, and he was going to university and he ran into a colleague who said, I gotta tell you what happened to me. I died last year and I was dead for six minutes. And he told him his experience and that led him down this path of research. Yeah. It's interesting. I didn't know how many of these experiences included life reviews, but it seems like from these experiences, it's pretty common. You get a life review and you get a <laughs> life review. Oh, Oprah. Conspiracy. Synchronicity. Sasquatch. Homunculus. Alien races. Satanism in Hollywood. MK Ultra. Tartaria. There's like a whole, I've been watching this one guy. Close the door in. Jury. Close your door. What's the, uh... Inner Earth Disagreements. Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman. Bohemian Grove. Corey Feldman. Magicians are demons. Spectres. Spirits. Spirits. Sleep paralysis. Occultism. Muslim Islamists. The gender spectrum. Yes! Alternative history. Shadow people. Shh, quiet. I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf towers. I would never talk about it. That's old. Y2K. Cover-ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Well, hello, hello. We missed you. Yes, it's been a a bit of a break. It was a good break. Yeah. We appreciate you, is what they say. That's what people say when they thank you now. Appreciate you. You know what I'm saying? Appreciate you. I mean, it's been around for a while, or if it's a Southern thing. I don't think anyone ever says that, ever. Really? No. It's a thing. I talked about this with friends that I have. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Yeah, it's just another way to say thanks. Well, we appreciate you all for coming back after our break, and we are excited to be back with kind of a fun, slightly different topic than normal. Yeah. After life travels. I mean, you're just experience. I mean, come on. Everybody's got one. I mean, come on. Everyone's got one. <laughs> I know that you've been wanting this for a long time, John. Right. And mom has too. She loves this topic. A lot of moms out there want this topic. And even dad had some, he had documents. Yeah, he gave me a folder. I came over, he had a manila folder. And he goes, really? You doing life after death? He's like, I've been saving this for years. He pulls it out. There's <laughs> a, like a browned article from 1997 in there. He's got like copies. 94, there's a review on the back of one of those newspaper clippings of Radiohead's OK Computer. That was oh, cool. Wow. Which was interesting to read because it was talking about how Basically, the warning of dehumanization through technology. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, wow, that's, Appropriate. Uh, that was very prophetic. We wanted to do something, you know, with all the craziness in the world right now, something that kind of just solidified the idea that there's more yeah. than this material world right, right in front of us right now. At least that's why I kind of wanted to yeah, do it. Yeah, that makes sense. And it definitely seems like after all the, all the research we've been doing, it definitely points in the direction that there, the life does not end right. with this mortal coil. Different sorts of experiences, but I think it's one in seven people have a near-death experience. No. Is it higher than that? It is higher. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So I have the the documents here. (laughs) I got the documents. 
So basically, like, I wanted to grab some information about kind of a definition generally. So we could say, like, what qualifies in your death experience? Right, right, you know, right. What are some characteristics? But there were some interesting statistics. So Jeffrey Long published this in the Missouri Medicine Journal in 2014. And in there, he states, There is no uniformly accepted definition of near-death experience. Definitions of NDE, or near-death experiences, with some variability have been used throughout the 35-plus years that NDE has been the subject of scholarly investigation. From my retrospective investigations, individuals were considered to be, quote, near death if they were so physically compromised that if their condition did not improve, they would be expected to irreversibly die, as opposed to reversibly die, I suppose. Um, (laughs) Is that like the bar that they have to meet? So that's basically like... Because there are people that like have died, literally like medically died and then have come back. For sure. So that's, so he's kind of defining it in these two ways. I'll I'll finish reading this last bit here. Near-death experiences investigations were generally unconscious and may have required cardiopulmonary resuscitation. The experience component of an NDE had to occur when they were near death. Also, the experience had to be reasonably lucid, which excluded fragmentary or brief disorganized memories. Right. For an experience to be classified as an NDE, there had to be a score of above on the NDE scale, which is interesting, I didn't know there was one, a score of three. The NDE scale asks 16 questions about the NDE content and is the most validated scale to help distinguish NDEs from other types of experiences. So yeah, it was interesting to think either you die, right? You flatline, right? And you have some extra life experience once you're medically dead. Right. But then in his research, he's also including those experiences where you're at the point at which if you do not have intervention, uh, you will die. Like you're having a heart attack or you're, you're not breathing anymore. If someone doesn't come in, the experience can begin at that point. Right. It's part of the argument. That's it, interesting because there's one fascinating case I came across. I didn't include this because it's so far left field of what we're talking about, but included in these stories of near-death experiences was one man who had pulled off the side of the road. Nope. I got that story. Oh, you do? I think so. The fl- With the flowers? Yeah. Yeah, I have it. Okay. It's great. That deals with leaving the body so previously before actual death that it's kind of amusing right. what occurs. I guess I won't spoil it. Yeah, there are people that make the argument that the traumatic realization that you're about to die can elicit an out-of-body. Yeah, I titled the story Premature Evacuation. Uh, <laughs> Good one. The idea that you would leave your body because you see your imminent doom. That's an interesting concept, though. Yeah. The, just the awareness, the hyper-realization that you might die mm-hmm. can spontane. Okay, go ahead. You know what? That reminds <laughs> me of the, the idea that you know, that your spirit or your consciousness, your soul, whatever, is not so glued to the body, you know, not created by the brain. It's that idea that it's, Mm -hmm. you're receiving that signal. So in a moment where, yeah, and you don't want to, your soul doesn't want to experience this moment. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stories of this, whether it's an incident like Jeremy's about to read, or whether it's someone in the hospital dying a slow death of something, there's periods of leaving the body before death, you know? I hear that with trauma situations, like even abuse. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You can like leave their bodies. Yeah, you get a lot of -of out-of-body experiences from that kind of thing. Why don't we go into this one real quick? Okay. It'd be fun to start off this way. Yeah. Oh, and to answer your question before I read this, it is 17%. About 17% of those who nearly die, uh, people, you know, on their deathbed are about to die, but come back. Striking figure. 17% of those people experience something coming back and telling that story of uh, persistent existence, I like to refer right. to it as, you know. So you have premature evacuation and persistent existence. I like that. Yeah. It's just good. Rhymes. Um, you want to get in the story? Yeah, let's get in the story. Don't uh, push him so hard. Sorry. Okay, so this comes from a book called Beyond the Light by researcher P.M.H. Atwater from 1994. And we'll have this linked in the show notes. There are cases of near-death-like experiences that mimic those which occur during the trauma of death itself. One of those is the story of Julian A. Mikes. My mother and I were driving out to the lake one afternoon. My dad was to follow later when he finished work. We were having company for dinner, and as we rode along, my mother spotted some wildflowers at the side of the road. Oh, pretty, look at those. She asked if I wouldn't stop the car and pick them, as they would look nice on the dinner table. I pulled over to the right side of the road, it was not a major highway, parked the car and went down a small incline to get off the road to pick the flowers. While I was picking the flowers, a car came whizzing by and suddenly headed straight for me. As I looked up and saw what I presumed to be what would be an inevitable death, I separated from my body and viewed what was happening from another perspective. My whole life flashed in front of me. The review was not like a judgment. It was passive, more like an interesting novelty. 
I can't tell you how many times I think of that near-death experience. Even as I sit here and write my story to you, it seems as though it happened only yesterday. Mike suffered no injury. The speeding car veered off just as suddenly as it had appeared. Researcher PMH Atwater has observed that the terror of an ultimate end, the kind of terror that sees no hope, no other alternative except death itself, is sometimes enough to shift people into a near-death mode. Illness, injury, or body trauma is not necessary. Interesting. Yeah, it's also kind of uh, reassuring. Mm-hmm. It's like a soul life jacket. Right. Parachute. I remember when I, I told you I did the sound design for those... Uh, Oh, yeah, near-death experiences. Yeah, they were like heavenish sort of things. Yeah. There was a lady that I remember said that she, it was a similar situation. She was pinned underwater, and uh, she like separated from her body, and she didn't die. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sort of a thing. Like, yeah. like it was like a pre-shift or something. Just similar. Yeah. That was a great story, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's the anecdotal point. You right. know, that the, these yeah, experiences that happens, do happen. Right. Um, but I I never heard that before, that idea of that premature It is kind of nice, though. So if there's something horrible... Yeah. Well, we're, we're not promising anything. Right. Like, don't hold us to it. That's the thing is, in all these experiences, I had a really hard time picking out stories to use because there were so many interesting ones. And there's always aspects that are different but fascinating. So it's like, I really want to do all these. But you have to... It right. pick a couple, but each one has these little interesting, unique aspects where you're like, oh, I really want to talk about that. But they're not all the same. So where someone might have you know, the fortunate experience of leaving their body before they get smashed by a car, you know, there's experiences where people have a long, slow removal from their body. And a lot of researchers suggest that this might be because the more connected you are to your life and not have let go of certain things in your life, the harder it is to transition out of your physical body. Yeah, we hear that a lot. But you'd think though in a, like in a traumatic situation like that, where it was instantaneous, you wouldn't have a whole lot of time to like, be like, I'm not ready. It would be interesting to, to see the numbers on how many people who saw it coming mm-hmm. saw something traumatic and uh, pretty instant yeah. coming at them. How many people did leave? In it's that kind moment? of a nice feature, though, for people, <laughs> yeah. people that uh, you know experience really traumatic, horrible, right. like being murdered or something. Yeah, you know, to be able to leave before it actually happens. Right. Is- well, it's almost like the alternative to like if you have a longer, slower trauma, like a physical, mental abuse, you know, like MK Ultra kind of stuff, mm-hmm. that disassociative effect that that can have for, yeah. you know, I mean, that can go into a whole like conspiracy idea, but just even like basic trauma victims have that kind of disassociation to protect themselves mm-hmm. psychologically from that experience. This is like, it's gotta be done now, yep. you know? So it's, if you're disassociated to a different person, you're still gonna get smashed by this car. It's crazy. So you gotta get out of the body. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting. I feel like I've had that before. I can almost oh, feel like, it happening uh, where you're like, maybe it's just been in dreams. Yeah. But that ability or the to out of separate body. yourself from Sometimes your body. Sometimes it's right before sleep too. Right. That can happen. When I had my out-of-body experience, ever since then, like once in a while, I'll have the feeling of this sort of numb warmth mm-hmm. wash over me. And it's I almost feel like I can leave. Almost like I can, right. I can intentionally do it yeah. at will. But I can never quite get there. But I've had moments where I've gotten really close. But I recognize that feeling because I've, I've left my body before. I got a trampoline today. <laughs> I heard awesome. that. Maybe I'll jump out of my body. <laughs> wow. <laughs> How awful would that be? Like you're talking on the phone to jump and you're like, hey, and then you just shoot out of your my head. My body just collapses. I come over and you're, you're just like, how do you die on the trampoline? <laughs> <laughs> your soul's just swimming around on the ceiling. Sorry, I was just, I, I just popped in my head for some reason. That's how you're going to go. Nah. So yeah, as you were saying, like there's so many interesting stories. It was hard to whittle down for this episode because there's just limitless. But uh, besides all the unique attributes to these different stories, there are a string of identical or similar characteristics that kind of uh, bonds these, what you would call like a pattern. a pattern, right? So this the paper that I mentioned earlier from the Missouri Medical Journal. He lists the characteristics that are fairly common as such. The characteristics include a perception of seeing and hearing apart from the physical body, right? So like an OBE kind of experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, passing into or through a tunnel, uh, which is somewhat disputed. The specifically a tunnel, yes, but the idea of a threshold, that's in all right, cases, right. for the most part. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, encountering a mystical light, intense and generally positive emotions. Euphoria? Euphoria, for sure. Bliss. A review of part or all of their life prior to the experiences. Encountering deceased loved ones and a choice to return to the earthly life. So you hear that a lot, like, you know, if you're not ready, a lot of times it's not a choice. A lot of times... The they voice say will you're say, not ready to exactly. Come. Yeah. It's interesting. I didn't know how many of these experiences included life reviews. I always kind of heard that that was not that common of a thing, but it seems like from these experiences, it's pretty common. Yeah. And usually it's panoramic, which I thought was interesting. You get a life review and you get a life <laughs> review. Oh, Oprah. 
Yeah, and another thing which is interesting is uh, this was this was observed by Professor Bruce Green. He had uh, interviewed people from like in the eighties, and then forty years later, he interviewed them again, and he remarked that their memories of the NDEs, the near death experience, way clearer than any other memory from that time. Exactly. And yeah. unchanging. The stories don't change. And a lot of people report that like, they always say like, I'll never forget. It's so vivid in my mind and I'll never forget this. It's almost like it was disconnected from the degradation uh, of your usual memory right. that occurs because it's, it was outside of your physical brain. It happened in a place where, you know, it's almost like preserved. Right. This gets uh, explained away a lot by skeptics saying that, oh, you know, they think that they're seeing what's going on in the operating room or whatever, people around them in the ambulance. And it's really just an amalgamation of their memory of what happened before and then like some weird dreamy thing. But what they can't explain away is the fact that what they're describing is things that actually occurred with people's names they didn't know. And they're explaining it in a clear way. If you had, you know, your brain was low functioning or you're unconscious, it's not something that's going to be a crystal clear play-by-play thing, right. you know, especially if they get this claim it's like dream-related. And I've heard some medical stories. I don't have them here, but I've done a lot of research in this. And there's been a lot of cases where people that have died, you know, they, they can either say something about the room mm-hmm. or some sort of like something outside the room. Some piece of evidence or something. Right. We covered this a little bit on our Out of Body episodes. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah. But we're going to get to stories like that okay. coming up. And one from a friend of ours' mother who had a yeah. hospital out-of-body experience, near-death experience. Our good friend Brad, awesome drummer, his drummer in our band growing up, good friend. His mom, um, I didn't know this, she had a near-death experience. She listens to, what's her name? Uh, Tina. There you go. She has two, I was going to get to her name. <laughs> <laughs> Tina, great lady, she has two near-death experiences. They're kind of wrapped up into one short story, um, but really fascinating. It's uh, funny what you hear from people when you tell them you have a paranormal podcast. <laughs> it's like, oh, speaking of that, I had a strange experience yeah, once. Yeah. Most people probably have had something strange in their Unexplained. life. Unexplained. Or know somebody. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're going to get to her story. It's really interesting. But I, what I wanted to say was that doing an episode on this stuff, I think it's important to consider the fact that before the 1960s, no one really talked about this stuff. It wasn't right. in the mainstream idea, consciousness, that there was these common shared experiences of people dying, seeing loved ones, a tunnel of light, uh, hearing beautiful music. And it wasn't until Raymond Moody, Dr. Raymond Moody, who was a, a psychologist and a philosopher, and he was going to university, and he ran into a colleague who said, you gotta, I got to tell you what happened to me. I died last year. And I was dead for six minutes and he told him his experience and that led him down this path of research, started to discover all of these people who've had similar experiences and this pattern of experience once they've died and come back. And uh, he wrote that first book in the 1970s. Life After Life was the book that really kicked it off. What was it called? Life After Life. Okay. Yeah. And it was kind of a breakout thing for, for society. It changed a lot of the way that even medical researchers looked at um, death and dying. And speaking of death and dying, one other person we should mention is Elizabeth uh, Kubler-Ross because she uh, she wrote the first book called Death and Dying that identified the stages of death and really looked at death as like a spiritual process mm-hmm. that actually was able to push forward the idea of hospice. Before then, before this period, the 1960s, family members were basically put in a room. Family weren't allowed to see the family mm-hmm. members dying because they didn't think they could handle it. And the Nurses and doctors didn't know how to handle the death of someone, like psychologically, spiritually. So they basically left them alone to die That's and crazy. afraid. So you were saying basically the hospice, what we do in this country now and how we look at death is more, it's more, um, we engage more with it, with the people that are dying. It helps get people ready for the transition. And she was a big part of that. But, yeah. But sadly, uh, as she got more into this stuff, she helped with all that, getting like society to look at that in a more human, humane kind of connective way. Right. The dying experience. Naturally in that scenario, you're going to talk to people who've had inexplicable near-death experiences, right? And the problem, as you were saying uh, before the episode, is that as she was looking more and more into this stuff, as you would because you're in that situation, you start to report on these experiences. Right. Start, then you start to you know, be dancing a little bit in the woo area. Parapsychological. Dancing in the woo. <laughs> yeah, that's a great podcast name. <laughs> it is. But yeah, like you, so mainstream scientists and these kind of things would start to take you less seriously, right? Absolutely. Didn't you say that kind of hurt her Yeah, career? I mean, she, well, you know. Cred. Or street cred? Yeah, she wrote the forward to Dr. Moody's book who coined the term near-death experiences. He was actually researching these crazy experiences people were having on their deathbed while Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was publishing her book. So she wrote the forward to his book, which was about near-death experiences. She gets more into the phenomenon about what people are experiencing when they die. And over the years, she starts to get into spiritualism, mediumship. Um, she starts to get looked at as, as a kook because once she left just getting people ready for death and maybe like you know, understanding the process of this is a natural thing. Once she started getting into what happens after the transition mm-hmm. or what happens during the transition that's, you know, somewhat supernatural or unexplainable, that's when, you know, 
she started to get a little Science pushed out of the yeah. take you as seriously absolutely anymore. yeah which we which we all know sorry um, Elizabeth but you got to go where it takes you too you know absolutely well, that's the mark of a good scientist right it's the the hard questions that you should be looking at the ones that you can't explain easily with the current understanding well, science has become a religion at this point I feel like it's yeah, so dogmatic and like if it doesn't fit into the paradigm. We've talked about this right. a lot. But. And it's not every, obviously, like we have scientist listeners who are awesome. To yeah, it's not, it's not. As a paradigm as a whole, it is hard to. In this vein, especially. Well, anything yeah. that has to do with like consciousness, it's like. Although this, I would say this is one. Is it starting to change a little bit? Definitely. And it's because a lot of the work that went on, you know, the 60s and 70s and through the 90s. Consciousness existing outside the body. Yeah, there's and, so much research going into it. And then right. with the development of understanding quantum physics, there's a lot of stuff that kind of people point to as um, corroborating the ideas of spirituality and, you know, even on a somewhat materialistic scientific level, consciousness not being completely um, linked to the body in a way that you can't sever it without death. I think right? you can study this stuff probably now and be able to like not, you know. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it depends probably on what area. Mm -hmm. Neuroscience, they in. do a lot of studies in this stuff. I mean, you know, you, you have to be kind of careful about how you word things and, and stuff. I mean, you're not going to go super spiritual vocabulary when you're doing mm -hmm. it. Which I think is the right way to do it if you're going to do a paper. Well, and I think to prove attributes, you can't prove what it is or what it's like after. You can't prove a heaven, a hell. You can't prove the actual reality of what it is, but you can make an effort to um, establish a line of inquiry and evidence gathering about just consciousness existing after physical death. Right. Like weighing your body before and after you die. Yeah, that was always the famous one, right? <laughs> the, right. the grams. I've heard... It's uh, a some, little controversial, you're right. as you might expect. For people that don't know... I forget who it was, but essentially there was a, a fella, a doctor, I think it was a doctor, right? Who was, or was he a mortician, a coroner? I don't, I don't know, know, but we he did this had access to before. dead bodies and he would measure their weight, essentially weigh them before and after death. And he noticed there was like so many, what, micrograms or milligrams. Yeah, it was a measurable amount. His argument was that this was evidence that the soul has left. Right. But the, the difficult thing about that is it's hard to prove that because when a body dies, gases are released all of a sudden. Right, and right. this was kind of early on in med medicine when he did this experiment. I think it was like turn of the century. Souls last. probably don't weigh anything either. They might. Ever you know. never Maybe. know. You could, you could have a material tether, you know, to Maybe. the energetic. Anyway, I do want to get into in more of these stories, but I just wanted to say that it's interesting to just think like in our world, we're familiar with this idea of near-death experience. Most people have seen a movie or watched a television show where there's, you know, uh, someone visiting with a family member, helping them transition or seeing a light, this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's interesting that it wasn't commonly known that people had these experiences before the 60s and that it's becoming ever and ever more accepted. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. Right. So you guys ready to dive into a story? Let's take a break first. Yeah, and coming up, one of the things we're going to get into, I'm really excited about, it's something called shared death experiences, also researched by Moody in his book, Glimpses of Eternity, Sharing a Loved One's Passage from This Life to the Next. These stories in this book are awesome because they're living witnesses that experience the death of somebody, sometimes multiple family members in the same room, and unexpecting, some of them not spiritual at all, expecting nothing to happen, mm -hmm. and then experiencing what the dying person is experiencing, some of them leaving their own bodies with this person for a moment. So a shared, a shared near-death near experience because... They were happened to be in that room. Now, oh, yeah. what, what that means, who knows? I mean, there's questions That's like, interesting. is it a mistake? Is it, or did they mean to, was it, or did they need to go up with this person for someone to be comfortable? But we're going to get into those stories because yeah. the way in which these things occur are really interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of different interesting stories. We got animals coming up, a lot of, a lot of interesting things. Yeah. So uh, stay tuned, guys. All right, we'll be right back. Is there life after death? Today, there are many who have gone over the brink and return to tell us about it. They do not offer proof of life after death, but their reports give us a new perspective on the possibility that death is not an ending, but a beginning. Everybody, we're back. Hi, welcome back. Yes, yeah, so we're gonna get into some more stories, guys. First one we're gonna do here is the uh, the one I mentioned earlier from our good friend Brad's mom, Tina. Uh, yes. Awesome story. Thank you for this. Let's get into it. I've had two near-death experiences. I've been passing out since second grade. 
This would only happen when I got very sick. When I was 29, I got very sick with the flu and woke up in the middle of the night feeling like I was going to pass out. How I knew this is because before passing out, I get a hot band that starts, one at the top of my head and one at my feet. Terrible cramping in my stomach area. And when the bands meet, I go out. Now when I come back, I feel great, almost euphoric. This time was different. I went out, felt like I was in a tunnel. It was pitch black. I knew I had died, I just knew. And I knew I had to walk down this long tunnel. I was talking to myself and answering myself when from behind me, I could hear my husband's voice. At that moment, someone asked me what I wanted to do. I said, he needs me. The next thing I knew, I could feel my husband's breath on my face. He was screaming. This is what happened to him. He was sleeping next to me when suddenly he was awakened by the sound of me choking. He tried to help, but I took one last gasp and went limp. My eyes opened and rolled back. That's when he started to scream and shake me. I was about to perform CPR, but I came back. Well, of course, we ended up in the hospital. He told them I died. They told him he was overreacting. Since I was a heart patient with irregular beats, they had me by the nurse's station and told me to call if I felt like I was going to pass out again. After many hours there, I started to have that feeling come back again. I called the nurse, and when she came in, I told her I was going to pass out. I went out. This time, I went straight above the room. I could hear the speaker calling out over and over, and I watched all the doctors and nurses run towards my room. One moment I'm above the room, and the next, I'm back in the bed. I could hear my doctor say, she's coming back, don't shock her. I sat straight up, and everyone in the room jumped back, because most people that flatline do not and cannot just spring up. I'd flatlined for eight seconds. Well, that was 37 years ago. A pacemaker took care of my problem. Love you, boys. The show's fantastic. Thanks, Tina. That was a fantastic story. Yeah. One of the things I love about that story is the interesting detail about those bands. Yeah. From her head to her feet and mm-hmm. how they meet in the middle and then she goes out. I've never heard that from that kind of condition. Like right. you, you can feel the onset of it. Like, yo, here we go. Yeah. And, and it, it might be a, a common clinical thing with people who pass out regularly. I don't know. But it just reminds me of that feeling of, of going out of body. Mm-hmm. That vibration feeling that moves, the people report moving up and down, that I had that sort of vibration from the feet up to my head. Right. Might not be the same thing, but it just reminds me of that. It's interesting that then she, you know, died, left her body. Exactly. Yeah. But such a crazy story. Yeah. And I was curious. I asked her a couple of follow-up questions, but I emailed really late. But uh, I was curious to know about the tunnel itself, right? Like mm-hmm. she said, I felt as if I was in a tunnel. And I saw in my follow-up, I asked, you know, Did you see any structure, walls to the tunnel? What made you feel like you were in a tunnel? Because one of the interesting points that have come out is that, according to this other researcher I was reading, who we've got some of the stories from, she was suggesting that if you look at the studies of people who experienced near-death experiences and and use words to describe uh, what their experience was like, it's it's apparently a fairly unique trait to the West to use the word tunnel when describing they're in it. And apparently... The uh, the usage of that term after the release of this book, um, which kind of I guess hyped that term, then people started using it more and more. Like it became part of the lexicon. Right. And the concept is that in other countries, uh, as another researcher points out, in third world countries specifically, instead of a tunnel, they'll often say they were in a cave or a well. Right. You know, which makes you think like it's you know where they might not have the in- infrastructure that we do and like tunnels is more, is more common here. The term specifically, I guess from the book was the argument. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to be defined differently as far as like what you feel like you're in when you can't really see what it is. Yeah, exactly. And the thing about these experiences is that they're ephemeral or hard to describe. It's like one of these things where you can explain what it was like, but you can't describe it exactly. Right. I mean, that's super common in these experiences. So, but it's the idea of the same thing, the tunnel, the threshold, mm-hmm. the cave, the well, it's always sort of like in an entrance way right. that everyone describes for the most part. So I don't think it matters as much you call it a tunnel or whatever. Right. You know, it's uh, it's that bridge. Right. So should we mention, you said that some of the other cultures and some other experiences, like India specifically, had some really, really different stories compared to what we have. Like right. stories where it's more bureaucratic, like there's often long lines. Yeah, people getting kind of thing. mistaken identity a lot, people getting uh, pushed back into their bodies because they had the wrong guy from the wrong village yeah. with the same name. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get into those in the uh, expansion. expansion. Okay, yeah. very cool. Yeah, because that's an interesting concept, and what would what would cause right, that? Right, sort know? of the, the bureaucratic mistakes. <laughs> right, like <laughs> it's how, really interesting. Yeah, that cultural influence is interesting. The idea that like 
even if it is all, you know, one God, one creation, one eventual existence going back to the whole or united with the creator, that kind of idea, the way that we get there can be influenced by our cultural areas, even yeah. geography. Like maybe yeah. you're used to that, you're familiar, so it helps get you into the next mode without like totally frying your brain. And maybe it's still like, you know, the beginning stages. Mm-hmm. You're not completely like, it's, yeah, it's that introduction where it's just make things a little bit comfortable. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing with these accounts is that there is that in between state where you have a, a guide often. You're going through the tunnel or you're going up the beautifully forested hill. Right. That's a very common thing where it's sort of a, a tunnel path in, the, in this beautiful forest. Uh, but once you get to that hilltop, that's when the decision is made either by you or the guide or an unseen voice. There's that barrier. Once you cross that, there's no coming back. Right. You might be able to visit with you know ancestors or a guide or something for a moment, maybe spend some time in this transitional plane. But after that decision, that's the barrier. Right. Not the, not the light necessarily, but after the that, choice. The choice, yeah. yeah. Interesting. So I have a story that relates, or do you want to do one of your shared stories, Chris? Um, yeah, if it relates, go ahead and do one of yours, and then we'll jump into the shared stuff. Okay. Only if it's good, though. John, this one's for you. Because it involves a doggy. <gasps> yeah. So that idea of there being this kind of like space in between, right? Like it's not the final heaven or, or afterlife or reincarnation, whatever. This is it's like, like a this, lobby. It's like a lobby. It's like a, <laughs> it's a introductory, you know, it's the you know, kiddie pool you swim through to get to the deep end, right? So this is an interesting twist on that. It has to do with the animals. Uh, John, this one is called, I'll have you read it here. It's called... Uh, at least some dogs go to heaven, which sounds sad. I only titled that because it's, you know, we can't prove all of them <laughs> go, sad. right? Uh, but there yeah. definitely are some. Okay, so this comes from Beyond the Light by PMH Atwater, and she starts by saying this. I found that both adults and children occasionally report being greeted on the other side by animals, but it is the children who describe an animal heaven, some even insisting that they must go through it before they can reach the heaven where people are. Oh, that's interesting. Adult cases can be equally compelling, such as the case we will read now from Bryce Bond. Several years before his death, Bryce Bond, a famous New York City media personality turned parapsychologist, shared the story of what happened to him when he once collapsed after a violent allergic reaction to pine nuts and was rushed to a hospital. He remembered suddenly passing through a long tunnel toward a brilliant light, and then... I hear a bark, and racing toward me is a dog I once had, a black poodle named Pepe. When I see him, I feel an emotional floodgate open. Tears fill my eyes. He jumps into my arms, licking my face. As I hold him, he is real, more real than I had ever experienced him. I can smell him, feel him, hear his breathing, and sense his great joy at being with me again. I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> so I gave it to you. I put my dog on the ground and stepped forward to embrace my stepfather when a very strong voice is heard in my consciousness. Not yet. It says, I scream out, why? Then this inner voice says, what have you learned and who have you helped? I am dumbfounded. The voice seems to be from without as well as within. Everything stops for a moment. I feel the presence of my dog around me as I ponder those two questions. Then I hear barking and other dogs appear. Dogs I once had as I stand there for what seems to be an eternity. I want to embrace and be absorbed and merge. I want to say... It's like you're sleeping with Jake. (laughs) I want to say the sensation of not wanting to come back is overwhelming. After being greeted by somewhat younger, happier, and healthier versions of all his relatives who passed on before him, he remembered racing backward through the same tunnel he had entered when it was time to leave and reviving in time to witness a hypodermic needle being plunged into his arm. Ugh. I heard a voice say, welcome back. I never asked who said that, nor did I care. I was told by the doctor that I had been dead for over 10 minutes. And that's wow. gotta be a Ten bummer. minutes in doggy heaven. <laughs> Can you imagine, like, all of a sudden seeing all your dogs at that once crazy. That, that you had lost? Like, because yeah. you had, you know, f- you forget about it, your animals over time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, more than people. Right. Because it's a usually a shorter experience yeah. living with that. And, like, your your childhood dogs. Yeah. And, That'd be like, so weird. Yeah. Like Sandy and Sydney. And, and the memory Ollie. of all of them and the feeling of each one comes back at the same yeah, time. Yeah. It would be a, a very overwhelming. Definitely. But I, I'm confused. So the. You said something about that there being like a, an animal heaven? Yeah. I mean, or animal afterlife. Is that separate from... That's what... So the, the children often 
report that, that they have to go through an animal heaven before they get to, like it's specifically for animals. It doesn't mean there's not crossover. You know, it, it could be structured in such a way, but it doesn't mean that you can't. I mean, it makes sense. People have allergies. Yeah. You can't let it <laughs> run around everywhere. Exactly. Yeah, those continue on to the afterlife. <laughs> they Especially haven't cats. figured that out yet. It would not be my heaven with cats everywhere. It's the one Tell flaw of creation. <laughs> Chris, you just seem wandering around heaven just... <laughs> 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 I mean, I like cats, but you know, come on. It's forever. Um, cool, that was, that was good. That was yeah. fun. I've, I've got a, uh, one called Skull of the Reaper, which I titled it, and another one I titled uh, One Ring to Rule Them All, which is about a man, uh, well, with a ring. And you're going to do those in the expansion, you think? I, yeah, I'll do them in the, the expansion episode. So if you guys are interested uh, and I don't get to those in this episode, uh, click on the link in the description for the expansion episode and you can sign up to be a member. And if you're a member, uh, we'll see you over there when the time comes. Yeah, that'll that'll be fun because that'll be uh, some of the more weird, offbeat, a little more inexplicable yeah. uh, experiences of afterlife travels. But what I want to talk about, it's a whole genre of fascinating after-death experiences, which is that shared experience. So I think we can yeah. all relate to the idea of getting to experience what someone else, a family member or a friend is experiencing. Yeah. And it happens to all types of people. It's not just, you know, family members in the hospital who are dying. It's people on the battlefield who are in, you know, the same foxhole with another guy and a bombshell explodes and he's holding him. You, they both get tracked or beamed, you know, <laughs> both looking down at their, like, Soul one person's beamed. died, the other person That's just maybe gets caught up I in wonder it. if that happens to hospice workers. Yeah. Really? Yeah, there's plenty of stories in this book. If you mm. guys are interested, I definitely recommend this book. It's really interesting. It's full of these stories. We'll do a few here and probably a few in the expansion. But yeah, plenty of stories of doctors even, uh, EMT workers seeing uh, the disembodied spirits that no one else is seeing. I have a really interesting story about that. We might do that on this episode if we get time. But let's dive right into these because I think these are really fun. Did we get time or have it? It's an interesting question. Wait, what? This one's cool. I mean, all these stories are interesting, like I mentioned, all these shared uh, near-death experiences. Uh, but I wanted to start with one which is pretty hard to deny. I mean, if you believe the family involved because it was multiple people in the room, it wasn't just one person who had an experience. Hmm. So it's hard to write it off as a delusion. And Moody starts off this story by saying, what was that book called one more time? Is this the set for that yeah, book you're it, Yeah, about? it's called Glimpses of Eternity. I would like to read that. It's it's excellent. You also referenced Life After Life. Right, that was kind of what that kicked was the off. first one. That's what coined the term near-death experience. That's from the 60s or early 70s. Yeah. Do you have it in Kindle format? I have it on Kindle. You mm -hmm. can borrow Actually, it's free on Kindle if you... Uh, oh, really? Well, I have a membership for the whatever the... You, you can use mine. Your, give me your password. Yeah. All right. I, I did want to mention it. A lot of these stories, excellent resource, is called uh, Enderf. N-D-E-R-F, yeah. Near Death Experience Research uh, Society, is that what it is? Foundation. Or study? I think it's study. If it's F at the end, it's foundation. It's S. Enderf? Oh, Enders? Maybe it's Durs. <laughs> oh, maybe we're, I don't know. Anyways, we'll have a link <laughs> in the show notes. Uh, but what's great about this resource is that one of the studies, I think the Missouri study, might have actually been based on those people surveyed from that site. Because what they do is if you have a story submitted, not only do they get the story written out, uh, there's a QA and a that the person has to fill out that's like 16 or so questions long. So every question you might want to know, like, do they have a religious background? Does right. that inform their beliefs uh, or what they experienced? Did you, you know, smell, feel things? Did you feel separated from the body? All the, you know, all the basic questions of like, is it, does this meet the criteria of life after death? What did you experience? So you can make a pattern, correlate all those, those cross-reference those questions with all the other experiences. So it's just, a, it's a great resource and uh, I'll link that in the show notes because that's where a lot of my stories came from. Yeah, we'll have tons of links for you guys in the show notes. Tons. So check out our website, bleefold.com, to find those full show notes. Episode page. Bleefold.com. All right, so Moody starts off by saying, one group of shared death experiences that baffled me were those events that were shared by several people at the bedside. It is possible for a skeptic to easily write off a dying person's death experience when it is shared with only one other person. But a death experience shared with a number of people at the bedside is more difficult to pass off as an individual fantasy. Take, for example, the experience of the Anderson family from a suburb of Atlanta as they sat by their dying mother. This is told by one of the sisters, but all who were there corroborate the account. The day my mother died, my two brothers, my sister, my sister-in-law, and I were all in the room. My mother hadn't spoken a word in several hours and she was breathing in an irregular pattern. None of us were really upset because mother had been on a long downhill course and we knew this was the end. Suddenly, a bright light appeared in the room. My first thought was that a reflection was shining through the window from a vehicle passing by outside. Even as I thought that, however, I knew it wasn't true because this was not any kind of light on this earth. 
I nudged my sister to see if she saw it too. And when I looked at her, her eyes were as big as saucers. What is that? At the same time, I saw my brother literally gasp. <gasps> Everyone saw it together, and for a little while, we were frightened. Then my mother just expired, and we all kind of breathed a big sigh of relief. At that moment, we saw vivid bright lights that seemed to gather around and shape up into, I don't know what to call it except an entranceway. The lights look a bit like clouds, but that is only a comparison. We saw my mother lift up out of her body and go through the entranceway. Being by the entranceway, incidentally, was a feeling of complete joy. My brother called it a chorus of joyful feelings, and my sister heard beautiful music, although none of the rest of us did. I am originally from Virginia, and my sister, brother, and I agreed that the entranceway was shaped something like the natural bridge in the Shenandoah Valley. Yeah. The lights were so vivid we had no choice but to tell our story to the hospice nurse. She listened and then told us that she knew of similar things happening and that it was not uncommon for the dying process to encompass people nearby. Yeah, and that's a very benign experience yeah. as far as like a shared death. There are some that are so extreme that people end up getting caught up, like I said, in sort of that Etheric. soul tractor beam. Yeah. Mm, it's really interesting. Soulnet. One guy described who was a doctor, I'm not going to tell this story, but um, he witnessed this mist in a period of six months, like two different people that had died in this intensive care unit where he witnessed this mist. And we saw it the first time, it startled him and alarmed him and he was confused. And then the second time he really like inspected it as it drifted away. And he said it was like, almost like looking at water moving within water, almost like this sort of plasmic mist, which correlates to the light that's often the sort of plasmic light. But it's just really, really interesting. It sounds like hmm. my smoke monster. It does remind me of that, yeah. A little more pleasant, though. Yeah. <laughs> Mine was pleasant. That's what was weird. Is I mean, Not the way you described it to me. But I had a very pleasant feeling. It was more just curious. This smoke. Playful. You were in a, like a really smoke mist. dark place, though, when you saw it. <sighs> I don't know. It was up and down. That's yeah. what you told me <laughs> when, when I was there. Well, maybe. I don't remember. I, this is the demon I always look back now. with an optimistic eye. <laughs> you know? get, out, get out of Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> Did, uh, wasn't it going to give you powers? Did you feel like it was going to give well, you some Well, that's what I was curious power. about. Yeah. <laughs> well, I did. I was curious because it was like wrapped around. It was a really good place. It made my hands glow. And I thought I, then I like reached out my arm like 11 from Stranger Things to try and move a, a oh, toilet boy. paper roll from my desk. Wow. Which, you know, I couldn't do, which disappointed Surprise. me. Surprise. And uh, then I was enraged with my lack of powers and the, the mist monster left. But why have you forsaken me, <laughs> ghost monster? Anyway. It's interesting though. Yeah. It's cool. It's another reassuring thing. It's just like. Yeah. And there's so many of these, and I hadn't really heard of this phenomenon. Me either. This sort of shared experience. Apparently mm -hmm. the nurse, what she said, this is a pretty common. Yeah. For the spiritual, like the death process. To encompass. To encompass. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. People nearby. It's like there's a field. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that transition is like, it's kind of like it opens up a portal almost. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. And that that's that's the cool thing. And they're all all those stories are somewhat different but very similar. But I love the stories where it's like, yeah, there's this portal gateway thing opening. And then, you know, sometimes in this book there's experiences where people see dead people and there'll be like a daughter in the room mm -hmm. and she'll be encompassed in this death process, but she'll recognize a couple of the people that her mom's visiting as she's moving over to the other side, but she won't know some of them because they're from before she was around. Right. You know, it's just interesting. Um, but speaking of this getting caught up in Maybe we should jump to this story. It's a, a story of a brother who shares the death of his brother. Oh, that's I thought funny. it was kind of kind of funny. Yeah, so this is another one from that book. Um, whoever wants to read this, John or Jeremy? I'll read it. It's just pretty short, but pay attention because it's definitely interesting. Oh, brother shares yeah. death? Okay. And laughs. Is that what you titled it? <laughs> yeah. Brother shares death and laughs. Juan, a very intense man in his 30s. <laughs> 30s. <laughs> Uh, in his 30s, approached me at a conference in Spain. This is the author speaking, Moody? Yeah, so Moody's speaking again. Okay. Approached me at a conference in Spain. So this was a story about the death of his much older brother. He and his sister-in-law were in the living room of her house when the older brother walked into a room, stumbled and collapsed onto the floor. Juan pulled his brother onto the sofa while his sister-in-law called the emergency services and waited on the doorstep for them to arrive. Juan hovered over his brother, who suddenly went from being extremely distressed to extraordinarily calm. A smile of peace and serenity came over his face, which frightened Juan. Suddenly, Juan felt himself lift out of his body and looked down on the scene below, which consisted of him hovering over his brother's body. From this perspective near the ceiling, Juan could see his brother leave his body in a sort of clear light that rose from his chest and moved rapidly away. 
Juan said he knew his brother was saying goodbye to him, but he could not say that he heard the words through his ears. Rather, he heard them in his head. With his brother gone, Juan faced another dilemma. This is where it gets interesting. He couldn't get back to his body. At first, he panicked. Then he relaxed and enjoyed it. Ah, this is what death is, he told himself, reveling in this unique, unusual perspective. Finally, when emergency services arrived, Juan returned to his body. He began to laugh when that happened. The emergency service people were surprised to find me laughing over my brother's dead body, said Juan. I didn't tell them what had happened because they would have taken me to the hospital instead of my brother. I thought it was interesting, and I didn't, until you read it back, I didn't think about this, but you know, there's often these stories where people in the room leave their bodies with the dying person. But it was interesting that he was leaning over his brother and he leaves first, almost as if like, because he's in the way. He gets, <laughs> I never put that together before, but hmm. he's, yeah, he's kind of above his brother, standing over him. He gets taken out of his body, sees him looking down at his brother, and then his brother leaves out of his body. So he, did he They're see like his brother leave? balloons. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, he sees his brother leave. Okay. Really, pretty quickly. But that's why he comes, that's why he's laughing when he snaps back he's into like, his ah, body. I'm out here in the world of the dead or that space in between. It must have been a pleasant experience. Yeah. And that's what they say, like generally. Generally. For the most part. It's either yeah. a pleasant, uh, kind of neutral experience, but very, very pleasant and calm, or it's like just overwhelming joy and bliss. Um, and then, of course, you have the darker stories, <laughs> right. you know, which are apparently a lot less common, but they, they definitely do happen. That's good. Yeah. But according to researchers, the woman I was reading referred to them as fairly seldom. That that yeah. happens, which is a good thing. Yeah. And when they do, they're always restorative. It's always re- reformative, you know, find mm-hmm. your way to having a better life. But you always have more gratefulness for your life and then act accordingly. Yeah, it's right. interesting because there's, you know, everybody has different beliefs and different ideas. But there's also stories about neutral experiences or just feeling like there's a a feeling of peace and calm. That's an occurrence that happens too. A sort of drifting into the oneness of creation and love and all this stuff. So, right. I mean, it's it's just obviously it's the big question. So we're going to take a quick break, do some more cool stories before we do. John, you got a stinger yep. for us? Awesome. So we got Ben Cherry and Donna this nice. time around. Awesome, groovy. So who's this one? This is Ben. Ben. He's been with us for a long time. Yes. And we're coming up on A these. lot of these uh, stinger people have because we're yeah. trying to catch up. So thank you, everybody <laughs> who's been patient. Every single time. <laughs> I know. Well, it's, it's true. It's a fact. It is a fact. We got inundated at the beginning and then we had to cut them off for a long time. Yeah. Try and catch up. All right. Here, Ben, I hope you like your song. <laughs> Wow. Hey, Ben Cherry, <laughs> we are sorry that it took so long to make a stinger for you. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> but don't worry, because we're still here in the hole, just waiting to fill your earbuds. You took a chance and you made a pledge. Five dollars a month, he says. <laughs> now it's 50. <laughs> Actually, a really good song. That made me emotional. The way that the, the shifted to that, the yelling kind of hook there. Yeah, like, I don't know. It, when that hit me, I was like, oh, "That was serious." Like this is <laughs> this is like a professional. Very good, man. Thank you. That was great, man. It's always fun when Chris. I think you said it almost every time when it, you're just like, "Oh, this is a long one." <laughs> this is a long one. Yeah. Huh? You said. I, I think you meant that in a positive way, though. They're usually in between like a minute twenty and a minute thirty. I mean, I like that because sometimes I feel like you start to get into it and then it cuts off. Yeah. I mean, then, they're all pretty similar. If there is this song, it's like a verse, bridge, chorus. Right. Right, right. right. Usually. Yeah. But anyway. And then another cool. 500 bucks and we'll finish it for you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, yeah. So I hope you liked it, Ben. And uh, we will take a break and we will be back. Amen to that. See you in a sec. I don't want to die. I want to come back the answers to death and life. I need you to bring me back. Bum ba da 
bum, 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 bum. Are we back? Yep. Oh, cool. All right. Here we are. Back from the dead. Back from the dead. We all died on that break, by the way. Very clever, Chris. We came back. Speaking of which, if no one's seen it, go watch Flatliners. Back from the dead. Oh, yeah. Flatliners. Classic. Remember that movie, John? Kiefer yeah. Sutherland? Mm-hmm. This time you're right. It was Kiefer Sutherland who was in it. <laughs> Kevin it's funny Bacon. because, you know, that movie, they come back and then like they're suddenly visited by people from their past that have died. Like they've weakened that barrier because they came back to life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you remember the plot of that movie? Over and over again. Over and over again. It's a group of scientists that were trying to basically prove that. Wasn't there a remake of it? Yeah, I heard it was not Oh, great. they were med students, right? Right. So they right. would sneak into the facility and then kill each other, essentially. Like basically right. incapacitate you. Flatlining. They flatline you. It's based on a novel. It might be based on a true story, too. I don't know. Flatline. He's dying. Brain death. Now it's real. Start filming. Let me defib him. He's dead. Isn't that enough? Let me try and bring him back. Excuse me. I don't want to ruin anybody's evening, but are we in the room with a dead man? Oh, my God. One minute to go. Start filming. Flatliners. Some lines shouldn't be crossed. Kind of a freaky movie. Yeah, dude, oh, it yeah. was. There's the one guy who like apparently filmed all of his uh, sexual escapades with all his ex girlfriends oh, yeah. and just random girls, and like that his hell or his his I guess limbo and experience was once they thin that barrier, keep coming back. I guess weaken that barrier. He gets haunted he by his get girls, visited by all the girls that had that he had filmed while that he alive, had taken advantage of. Yeah, that coming. I think some of them were like still alive, but it was like his sins were coming to haunt him in right. a way. Anyway, it does get really creepy. Yeah, and, I know it's it's definitely it reminds me of like Jacob's Ladder or something. Yeah, it was it was a really good movie. I heard the remake was not great, but check it out, guys. Maybe we'll do a watch check along. Check it out. Let's do a watch along sometime. By the way, I think that would be fun. We should, especially on those older movies, because there's so much to like laugh at, banter about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm gonna do one more story about these shared death experiences for the main episode. Um, I'm gonna skip one of them. I was gonna do basically it just covers the really cool phenomenon of having a shared life review which is hmm. really interesting. I mean, you imagine being it. That'd be embarrassing. <laughs> well, that's the thing is that people that experience this, they're going to see things that are, you know, they've never seen before, but it's it's covered in that sort of ephemeral, warm, everything's okay feeling. So, you know, they're embarrassing moments, but there was no embarrassment feeling right. or like jealousy or anger. It was just, that's what You're happened in, in their life. the warm goo of understanding. Yeah, that this is all coming Why to Why am I head. driftings with goo? <laughs> By the way, we nice did one. have a really interesting write-in. We put out that ad to get people to send in their stories. Right. We got a, a couple listener, more listener stories, right, that came in through email. Yeah, we should definitely get to those because those were fascinating. Uh, the girl whose um, brother passed away. Yeah, this one was really interesting. Really intense And sounding. I'd like to know if this experience for her was more on the spooky side or more on the reassuring side because by the how the story goes, I feel like it could go either way. Yeah, I would like definitely to know Definitely seemed more. like she was a little unsettled. So I would like to know a little bit more about what she actually was feeling during this experience. Especially, but, yeah, once your brother or someone's so close to you. Yeah. This comes from Louise, right? Okay, yeah. This is a pretty short submission, and we might reach out to you, Louise, and get a little more information, uh, maybe for a listener stories episode, because it is a really fascinating experience. Yeah, thank you for sending, especially anyone who's sending stories like this that are so personal. We really yeah. appreciate it. So this comes from Louise. I've seen my brother standing in a white cloak with a massive wooden cross around his neck in the middle of the road six months after he died. I was staying at my boyfriend's house when I saw this. At first, I thought I was just overtired. But just before I went to sleep, I saw him walking through the yard when I looked out the window. And then I saw him in the TV screen and thought, now I'm totally going crazy. So I went to the bathroom to splash some water on my face. And when I looked in the mirror, it wasn't my face. I saw it. It was his. Wow. That is, uh, that's intense. Yeah, I don't know. So it, it reads to me like it was uns- an unsettling experience because I feel like it would be, even if it was like yeah. s- someone you loved and cared about. They're- well, especially the, the, and you're seeing your face would be right. shocking a little yeah, bit. Yeah, the crescendo there at the end. Yeah, it's hard to like know how she felt about it though. Right. Yeah, I wish we would have had more time to reach out we to can, her. We can still reach out and just find out because mm-hmm. it could go either way. Like that could be the script for a horror film, like a possession type thing, or it could yeah. be a reassuring like just a nice way to say hello yeah like he's visiting letting her know that he still lives on right and is with her um do we have another story yeah and then there's a we had a great write-in from uh was it lena all the way from lithuania right awesome lena greetings from lithuanian beliefling i've listened to you guys almost from the beginning thank you for your hard work dedication 
for each topic in the whole for all the supernatural loving hermits out there. <laughs> I haven't experienced anything supernatural and won't mind keeping it that way. I love to hear other people's stories, but I'm a big wuss to live through them myself. Feel you on that. Yet I have one itty bitty story that I believe to be a glimpse to the idea that there might be something after death after all. Two years back, I suddenly lost my three-year-old dog, Bella. Oh. It was a very painful experience. It might sound macabre, but I haven't grieved my mother's death as I suffered as I lost my dog, meaning it was harder for her with the dog. Right. I often dreamt walking, playing with her, or feeling that she's somewhere around. One night, I unexpectedly dreamt of my mom. It was so vivid. I remember it very clearly to this day. Me and my mom sit in my sunlit room. We were both petting and stroking Bella, who sits next to us on the couch. Suddenly my mom says, referring to my dog, enjoy her for the last time because she can't stay here anymore. After this, dreams of my dog gradually stopped. The idea that she's somewhere safe and there might be a place for all of us to meet soothes the ache of loss and fear of the unknown after death. Lena. Thank you, That was Lena. beautiful, Lena. I wasn't expecting so many dog stories. Well, sweet. So hopefully after you listen to this episode, it gives you more positive encouragement that there's there's place for Bella. Yeah, the, the existence is bigger than whatever's going on in the news of the day. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And there, you know, there's some stories that are still coming in. And uh, check out our listener stories episode that we do periodically because you'll probably hear your story on there. Brandon, some other people that wrote Oh, in. you mean we do another listener stories episode? Down the road, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, thank you for that story, Lena. Thank you for everybody that's contributed to this really interesting experience phenomena, this big human question of, is there yeah, something after? Kind of the most important question. It is. Oh, Chris, wasn't there a story that you that you were going to do with... Uh... Yeah, I just thought this one was kind of funny. And it it's kind of a story of... Um... It's another shared one, right? Yeah, it's another shared one, but it's it's interesting because... It's uh, it kind of brings two people together who were estranged, not close in life. Yeah, and it's it's kind of funny. Not close in life, but close in near death. Right. Interesting. So this comes again from Moody's book and his uh, when he collected experiences about this and specifically the stories about the shared death experience. A woman named Dina told me the story of a shared death experience she had while caring for a distant great aunt, by which she meant a relative who had never been close to the family. As Dina put it. We drew straws for who would take care of her, and I lost. The two days before her great aunt died were tough on Dina. The great aunt was, quote, prattling out of her head about dead relatives, talking to them as if they were in the room. I thought she was demented, and all I wanted to do was get away from her because it made me uncomfortable. This is a great niece. (laughs) I would be like, tell me all about it. (laughs) Who's here? Rather than try to provide comfort, Dina bought a stack of celebrity magazines at the hospital (laughs) newsstand. Way to vacate. Right, and buried her (laughs) nose in them. On the day her great aunt would die, Dina was absorbed in the pages of People magazine, ignoring the woman who was unconscious and only hours from death. All of a sudden, Dina distinctly heard her great aunt speak. She was surprised to hear her because she thought she was long gone. I said, get your face out of that stupid magazine and look at what's happening to me said the woman with a surprisingly strong voice. Dina looked up and found herself face to face with her deceased grandmother. Hello? Wait, wait, wait. <gasps> this is Dina's... So this is her grandmother and the sister of the woman who was dying. Dina's grandmother? Yeah. Who's alive, right? The grandmother's dead. She's seeing the ghost of her grandmother. Oh, okay, so the woman who's dying is her aunt. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so her aunt yells, look what's happening to me. Oh, okay. So she looks up and she sees the same thing her dying aunt sees, which is her dead grandma coming right. to take her away. <laughs> oh, uh, I see. I get it. Creepy. Dina looked up and found herself face to face with her deceased grandmother. The woman Dina saw was much younger than when Dina had last seen her and far more self-assured than when she was alive. Dina had a million things she wanted to ask her grandmother. But before she could speak, her grandmother disappeared. From that point until she died, Dina's great aunt was coherent. So the aunt is still alive. The grandmother didn't escort her away yet. Mm, huh. So this creates an interesting scenario where this niece who was estranged from this aunt all of a sudden can commiserate over seeing the aunt's sister yeah. and the niece's grandmother. So they're talking and her aunt who's been like out of it for the yeah, last- Yeah, all of a sudden is coherent. She's For months, she's just been not lucid no, or- she's totally coherent. Right. So- For the last few hours of her life, Dina and her great aunt spoke as if they had been close friends for decades. It was a conversation, of course, that included the late grandmother who had just been visiting. 
At nine that night, the great aunt died, leaving Dina sorry that she had not had a relationship with her all those years. It also left her with a question that she had asked me at the end of her story. Why, Dr. Moody, would I have this experience with someone that I didn't even care about? Oh, meaning her aunt? Right, which is one of these questions, like, it's not always like someone who's really close to this and that, and it's sometimes a stranger. Just proximity. Could Maybe be proximity. Maybe it was just the plan. Maybe it's just the plan. It was the part of the life plan. Yeah, who knows? It's interesting because there was an, another story of a guy who uh, witnessed his wife dying and had this extreme experience with sharing the life review being taken out of the body. So then when his mother was dying, he came back to the same hospital and the same doctor was treating him. And the doctor said, who was reporting this to Moody, the doctor said he came back and he was expecting the same thing happen to his mom. And when it didn't, he was really disappointed because he thought this is just what happens. Mm -hmm. But again, it's one of these things like, who knows? what patterns or what strings are Magical being pulled. Magical things are happening. Right. Well, there's that fella, uh, maybe we'll do it on the expansion, the one with the EMT. Yeah, we'll do that on the expansion. Okay. That's a great one. He witnesses someone near deathing. Right. And there's a very interesting thing that happens with a neighbor. Oh, uh, yeah. Who's it's, unaware that there's a disembodied it's a, spirit. It's a funny thing. story. Yeah. yeah. We'll get to that in the expansion. Um, but yeah, I just thought that was, that was an interesting one. And I thought kind of funny because it is one of those experiences of like an insolent younger person who just is totally disconnected from the older generation mm -hmm. who gets kind of a rude awakening and then regrets not having that connection. Well, at least she had it more at the time. end. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely learned a lesson there. Yeah. So if you guys want to hear more awesome stories, definitely head over to beliefhold.com, click the Patreon button. We've got a whole bunch of other shows up there for you. And thank you to everyone that is a patron. It's awesome, you guys. Yeah. Keep signing up. Keep us going. Yes. You are the blood that runs the, the lifeblood life of the force. belief vein. And to those who can't, it's strange times right now. Totally get it. So you know, if For you want, sure. if you, if you, yeah. but if you do like the show, you want to leave a review or send us a message, say hi, whatever. Smash you like. the like button if you're watching on YouTube. Every listener matters here in the whole. We that's right. love everyone out there who's engaged and writing in and just enjoying the show because that's what makes the show. Absolutely. So we got one, one more little quick. It's not really a story. It's just more of a, I don't know what you'd say. It's anecdote. It's not an anecdote. It's, it's just, an experience that that neurosurgeon yeah, it's, had. It's a guy named Eben Alexander who is a. Uh, he was a neurosurgeon. I think he still is actually a neurosurgeon. And he had a pretty profound experience considering, I think what's interesting about the story is he's worked with the brain his whole life and he right, thought yeah. he understood consciousness and he, um, he developed a form of like meningitis on the brain, like really serious. Yeah. It just hit him one morning. He ended up uh, going to the hospital and like he was just in a coma, like almost immediately. And um, during that time, I think it was like seven days, he had a profound set of experiences. And I'm going to drop a clip in here about the early stages of this experience. And he describes it as like an earthworm view of, it, it's kind of like the consciousness in this level of reality. Uh -huh. And he describes it as being almost like going through dirty jello. Oh, so it's weird. this real visceral kind of soupy yeah, area mucky. that we're in. Right. And uh, he eventually, so I'll drop that clip here. Okay. It's so interesting because uh, one thing that was very clear to me in that journey, and, and I describe in my book a very simplistic realm that was kind of the initial realm. And that was my realm that did not involve any memory of my life. There were no words. I had no body image. And in the book, I call that the earthworm eye view. Um, and it was very kind of monotonous and uh, sounds a bit foreboding when I discuss it. But uh, when I was there, especially since I did not remember anything of my existence before, uh, I was, I simply accepted it. It's more of like a muddy yeah. kind of place where you can... E underground, like roots, or, or I, I literally remember roots or blood vessels that were kind of all around me. I, and I could sense way off into the distance. Even though it was dark and foamy and, and uh, uh, occasionally some almost animal-like face would kind of boil up out of it and then go away, kind of a dark, uh, uh, a, a dark side to it all. Um, but you were able to get out of it. That was one of the most beautiful gifts of this was uh, when I had been in that lowly realm for a long time, uh, there was this lovely light, a clear, very clear white light that had a kind of a rough surface with these fine tendrils, white and gold, that were streaming off all around it. And it was slowly rotating as it came towards me. And it, the, 
probably one of the most beautiful aspects to it, aside from this lovely appearance, was the fact that it was associated with a perfect musical melody. And then the rest of it talks about these incredible journeys, essentially going through what he described as heaven. Yeah. And um, what's really interesting about it is this whole thing obviously changed his life. And he understood the brain, or what he thought he understood about it. And the part that was damaged in his brain, it would have been impossible to have these experiences because really? the area that it affected the most, like you could only have, if anything, very, very rudimentary thoughts and ideas. Like imagination kind he of? He said when he was in this primordial soup part, it was like he didn't know who he was. He didn't know any language. Oh, weird. It was nothing. Like nothingness. And he thought that that part could be related to potentially some brain activity that he had when his brain had it been like so badly brain damaged. Activity. But then he left and he had all these insanely vivid experiences. And um, one of the most interesting parts of the story is that after he'd come back, he realized he had had an incredible experience and you know, he went off and tried to figure out what had happened because he knew the part of his brain shouldn't have allowed these types of experiences. And he remembered one part of the dream that was very, very vivid. It stuck with him where there was just this beautiful girl and just smile at him, never said anything, but could talk with him telepathically. And, the, mm -hmm. and it said, like, you're always loved. You're, you know... Never alone. That kind yeah, of thing. exactly. Just the very comforting thoughts and just smiling at him. And it always stuck with him. And he found out, I don't know how much later after the experience happened, he was contacted. He was adopted when he was younger and he was contacted by his original parents. And somehow he had gotten a picture of his dead sister. No, no way. They never met. And it was her. Oh, that's, that's crazy. crazy. It was the one yeah. comforting Pretty him. Pretty affirming at that point. At that point, he was just no like, doubt. oh my God, like this is absolutely a real phenomenon. And he went on to write a book, right? Mm -hmm. Was it Proof the of Heaven? The book is called Proof of Heaven. He had a follow-up book called, um, I think, Maps of Heaven. But I read the book. It'd be awesome if there were actual maps, like fold-out maps. Yeah. <laughs> well, like a Tolkien I mean, map. I would recommend story. reading the book because it's pretty fantastical, the... Experiences, the, the descriptions of of his experiences beyond just like the pearly gates and yeah. the streets of gold, and you know, very detailed and fun fun to read. I remember really enjoying reading the book, and I wish that I would have read it sooner to the show because I'd have a little more to say on it. But you know, the idea that he's just this doctor yeah. that spent his life, you know, he was an atheist, totally, right? I think so. Yeah, he was. He didn't have any just he, pure he just like the material. Brain, he just thought the brain was where consciousness comes from. And right. obviously after this, he thinks of it as like a receiver, you know? Yeah. yeah, brain receives the consciousness from outside. Right. Yeah. And obviously, you know, you can't prove this stuff. It's all experience. But for someone to have that was a very critical, material-minded person right. and, and just be completely changed mm -hmm. after. Yeah. And that happens so much with, I think, people in, in yeah. these fields. There's mm -hmm. no replacement for experience. There's no substitution for that. No, nope. you know, right. It's um, going to change you. We were saying about the, you know, the very surreal stuff, like the really fantastical, my favorite stories of these after death experiences, you know, how they vary. And sometimes, you know, the tunnel of light is like more like a forest, that kind of thing. Colors are beautiful. Mountainscapes, these beautiful bodies of water that seem almost like the water's alive, everything, you know. But I love those stories where it seems like whole other worlds. And we're going to get into some really unique experiences in the expansion. A couple I have are like, almost seem like they're on an alien planet. The Mormons were right, is what you're saying. <laughs> Who knows? Who's the Tom Cruise religion? Oh, Scientology. 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 Oh yeah, Xenu. <laughs> Xenu, it's all real. <laughs> it's, it's all, all real. real. But uh, I just like that idea of like, I think oftentimes, especially if you grow up in certain religious background, certain cultures, or just even, you know, culture in general, how you get these pictures of white clouds. And we talked about this before, and golden you get streets. Scared. Yeah, it sounds boring. <laughs> but when you hear about stories like this and you're like, oh, it's, it is more alive than life now. It's not right. this finite. That's what he said too. The doctor yeah. said, that it's hard to describe, but it's way more real than this yeah, world. That's a, so the story you read about the dog, where he's like jumping up into his arms. And I, I bolded that one piece where he said, uh, he experienced him more than he'd ever experienced him before. Mm -hmm. Like the feeling of that love for that companion or that partner, whatever it is. Probably completely unfiltered like we Exactly. And it's the same thing we talk about, even in a very small way, when you take like a psilocybin or something, you have a, a, some mm. kind of trip, DMT or whatever it is, where you feel like 
and the, another description that happens a lot is seeing colors that don't exist here. Right. That are more grand. Like I've seen that a lot, yeah. Sensory stuff. More vivid and colors that you've never yeah. seen before. Basically, the further you move your consciousness from this earthly filter, this mm-hmm. plane of the physical body, uh, that seems to be when you're open to these kinds of, of things. Right. So it's an interesting kind of connective mm-hmm. attribute. Definitely. Yeah, this is a, it's a profound subject and I, I could, I love reading about these stories. I love hearing people talk about them. Like I could just, we could do five shows on this. Yeah. It's just, it's a fascinating topic. And it's also, you know, it's pretty important because no one knows <laughs> what happens after you die. And to, and to get some sort of like positive reaffirmations, I think is, yeah, is important right definitely. now. Yeah, I mean, keep your mind out, even if you're not a non-believer in the... Yeah, well, I mean, I think anyone also, listening this is has nothing be, to do with like religion. This right. is at least what we're talking about. Yeah, well, I mean, this, obviously, yeah, obviously it's, it's, tied, it's tied to religions and faiths and spirituality. It's all tied together, but... I think we try to keep it that way, just so people would have an open mind. With exactly, it. like we didn't want to approach the subject from the standpoint of like, this is the way to get here. It's more about t- discussing the reality of it and what people actually experience. Yeah. The pattern. Because you do have, you have the, the Christian mm-hmm. experiences that are very like, this was definitely Jesus. Like there was a story about this baby who had an experience between uh, one and two months old uh, where she had some sort of disease. And then she remembers going to the... And like, you, it's interesting, Chris, talking about the cultural beliefs in the tunnel that didn't come till mm-hmm. later sometimes. Well, in her experience, she was just immediately in white light oh, and floating. Yeah. There was no darkness, but maybe it's because she was so young, maybe newly born. But she described how there was this um, area that was like, that's where she wanted to be. And it, I guess it was maybe brighter, uh, but there was a figure, a, a silhouette that... Uh, you couldn't see any facial features, but it was distinctly masculine. When she first started talking, she told the story to her parents. Mm-hmm. Like, the, I, mommy and daddy before this, blah, blah, blah. She explained, like, the glass case that she was in, and her mom took that as meaning it was the incubator she was in. Mm. Um, anyways, describe the whole experience. She didn't know, obviously, what near the experiences were. And then at five years old, she goes to church, and she sees a painting of Jesus, and whether how culturally or ethnically accurate it was, uh, she identified <laughs> that as being the man that she felt the presence of or saw. Right. So right. some of that stuff can maybe get filled in with a, pers- a specific um, uh, definition and structure of religion as you experience it, as you grow. Um, but I think regardless, the, the this full, was just full to truth get is your mind it. open about it. Yeah. Like we right. all, have, we all have our beliefs about religion and um, yeah. And I, there were a lot of um, Hindu ones I was looking at and it's like the, a couple of the experiences, it was like they're sitting at a table with the Hindu God of death. Right. You know, so it doesn't sound as fun. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. Depending on what he, what his demeanor is. But yeah, and there's there's also some interesting accounts I want to get into that talks about whatever state of death this is, but it's this sort of it's always this this ending of ego, and I think that goes into the idea that like feeling things more and feeling uh, more compassion and love for things because you drop all of the concerns of everyday life, all that somehow mysteriously is gone, and then when people return from that state, they're like, I just wanted to stay there. Yeah. Even if they, it, so a lot of times it's a solitary experience people report, mm-hmm. but it's this feeling of complete peace and happiness. Um, and yeah, that, who knows? The attribute when you come back that seems very common, um, almost ubiquitous to use a fancy word, is that people have, the, they're either told or they they just have an instinctual feeling when they return that they need to do good and they want to do good. Right. Like they're, right. It's almost like that joy you get from helping people, that like warmth you get when yeah. you do something good for someone. Like you experience that to the millionth degree when you're, in this yeah, you realize place. it's the only thing that matters. So you want yeah. to do when you come back. Love, that's what I, I forget. There were a few different people, and now they're all blaming in my mind, but there was a couple poets, famous poets. you said bloody in my mind. They're all bloody in my mind. <laughs> um, there were a few different people, poets. Young was another guy who had a near-death experience, but it was the idea, coming back, the idea is you realize it's all about love. It's about loving the amazing aspects of the world we live in. Appreciating creation Nature, the beauty. It's about loving people. You know, It's about not giving as much of a crap about the day-to-day stresses. Right, your like personal problems. Right, thing. which is always a good lesson to think of. As the world melts down around <laughs> us. <laughs> exactly. Not here in the hole. Man's world. Man's Not world. God's world. Not the world of the ether. Yes, or the world of the trees. Not the world of the trees. Um, I was just going to say, the two people that we talked about, Jeremy kind of talked about how you get tainted when you start to look into this stuff as a scientist, as an academic, and you start to get painted with a certain brush. And you know, normally it makes sense you're going to go down these more uh, phenomenal pathways, these more like fantastical pathways. Metaphysical. Yeah, paranormal sort of pathways. Um, I just thought it was an interesting fact as I was reading about uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, we mentioned about how like she got a little, like people started pushing her away. She was involved in with some group that ended up started 
she wasn't, I don't think, directly responsible for this, but she was involved with a group where the, the leader of this group, paranormal mediumship group, was endorsing uh, having sexual relations with spirits they were conjuring. <gasps> so, Spectra, what's that called? Spe- it's a thing? Where yeah. is this going at the end here? <laughs> I'm just, I'm trying to say like the sad part about getting into this research and stuff, it can take people down, you know. Right, right. Like you can, yeah, be uh, painted with the broad brush of kind of the metaphysical. Yeah, and really I'm, I'm just. Spe- bring, spectrophilia or something. I really called. just bring this up because I, when I was reading about Moody, the guy whose book I'm researching, he built something toward the ends of his life called a psychomantium. Which is just an awesome term. Sounds amazing. Sounds yeah. awesome. But basically it's just. Also very dark. He, you know, went down this path and sort of wanted to continue to figure out how to relieve people of grief by communicating with spirits. Okay. So the psychomantium, it's basically like that. It sounds a lot like we cover with the mirror stuff, dark room, yeah. mirror, low lit candle. So he built one of these, these things in Alabama. Took talk to the dead? Yeah. I talk to the saying that you can get into trouble if you're... Yeah, I'm sure we, we covered that before. I'm just right. saying... That's a cool term. Uh, yeah, that's a, <laughs> psychomantium. That's no, the name for a podcast. My point was, though, that... The psychomantium. The lines are blurry. Not just getting it, like, you know, obviously, it's dangerous. You you go down this road. You, if you really do believe in this stuff, and bad things you're can happen careful. if you go to... Because you're not, you know, educated or you're not, you know, elevated to that level. Oh, and even if you are, it's like you're messing again with things that you can't see and don't understand right. and are way less powerful then. Right, we talked about this on Ouija board episode. Yeah, spirit communication. It's not always friendly spirits. But my point was just that I think it's hard because when a researcher goes down this path, you start to see the reality of this stuff. And then you can either get tainted with slander or you might get a little off the rails on this journey. Right. It's interesting. Yeah. That's all I want to say. Psychomantium. That's a great, great word. So we got one more stinger before we go. Cool. And then we're going to thank our, some of our recent patrons. Yes. So stick around for that guy. And then we're out. Howdy howdy. This is, this one's for Donna. Donna. I brought back some some friends that were in a long time episode ago. A long time episode right. ago. But I don't know. You guys will probably I'll remember them. All right, here we go. Thanks, Donna. Oh. Donna, Donna, Donna. <laughs> well, hello, Donna. We are back again. Back again. Here to give you a big thank you for becoming a servant to the whole. Oh boy. She's not a servant. <laughs> she's a patron. Patron? What's a patron? Patrons help fund the show by getting <laughs> double the episodes. Oh. Okay. Well, that's no fun. I thought they were servants. No. No. That's what you always say. They're just nice people <laughs> that help fund the show. Oh. Well, I don't, I don't like nice people. I'm a bringer of the dark, pain and suffering. <laughs> How can you be a bringer of the dark when you're afraid of it? I'm not afraid of the dark. Shut up, Frank. <laughs> yeah, shut up, Frank. I'm Frank. just saying, geez, you're always so hypocritical about things. Shut up, Frank. Fine! You know what, guy? I'm done with you guys. Here we go. I just wanted to say <laughs> thank you to Donna for being a patron, and you guys are being real angels. You are <laughs> such a baby, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. I'm leaving. You can do this all by yourselves. <laughs> 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 okay. We'll do it by ourselves, we'll friend. By ourselves. Okay, bye bye. We'll see ya. Bye bye. It's a door. God, he's so sensitive. I know, right? I think he gets that from mom. <laughs> uh, that's great. Yeah, I was like, it was creepy at first because all of a sudden I was in this hellish space. Especially after Afterlife episode. I know. <laughs> and, like, I didn't even actually why know. Why are we demons working that? for us? <laughs> What's funny is uh, I think the first time those guys appeared, there was no like background sound. It was just their voices. And this time, there was. Oh, there was. Yeah. I don't remember. I don't remember flames. Yeah, churning and people oh, moaning. I took the same exact. <laughs> oh, is it really? Mm-hmm. Oh wow. I guess I've never listened. Yeah, to Yeah, it starts the same way too. That's great. I miss, miss those guys. They're probably some of the nicer demons out there. They it's a joke. Be. They're yeah, not real. <laughs> <I know this laughs> you joke. always talk about it like it's this the real thing. Well, I'm just playing playing into it. That was good. Freaking Frank though. Frank, what a guy. No, Frank. Frank's actually the common sense one. Right. They don't like him because he's the one making sense. Yeah. Put him in their place. Like to tease him. Yeah. I can relate to Frank. Someone animate that. <laughs> yeah. So we need some animators for that. That's great characters. All right. Let's let's thank uh, 
our patrons. Yes, let's do. And if you don't hear your name and you signed up before June and you you never heard your name, let us know. We'll reach out to you. Um, But those of you who signed up after June, stick around. Upcoming episodes, you'll be hearing your name. So thank you to Alicia, Leland, Ashley Poirier, or Poirier, uh, John Mallory, Nick Benson. Double thanks. Kyle, David J. Zuizia. Awesome. Is that right? Sorry if I butchered that. Thanks to Kristen Todd, The Scientist, Chance Thornton, T. Montoya, Stephen Frazier. Thanks to Cyril Ham... Cyril? Cyril? Thanks to Sarah Hamilton. Yes. And Seth Atkins. Heck yeah. Also, thank you to Weston McCain. Oh yeah, great sky creature video. Oh, we, we gotta get on that. We're gonna do a YouTube video on that. Just wait. Joey Roxy. Mm-hmm. Joshua Facho. Sky Carlisle, what a name. Sky Carlisle. Stabby News Anchor. Courtney MC. Danny Jackson. Sasha Kendall. Mm-hmm. Harrison Thomas. Michelle Cornwell. Thank you. And that's it, guys. All right, thank you guys so much. Uh, a special thank you to our Stinger patrons today uh, that paid the pretty penny and have been patient. And uh, thanks to everyone listening. You guys are important. And, uh, and anyone on YouTube listening to this, we're going to be getting those videos out a lot faster. And we do... Appreciate you, yeah, for being there. Hopefully, by the time this airs, we'll be all caught up. Right, exactly. So we're gonna keep getting content out to you. Not, you can always listen to it on iTunes. Exactly. There's other places to get it. Spotify. And for those of you who are expansion members, head on over to Patreon to hear the expansion. Yeah, there'll be a link in the show notes. Stranger Life Travels. We're gonna cover some really interesting and unique cases of the after death experience, and maybe some different lands. After life. After life. All All right. right. I'm I'm gonna go jump on my trampoline. That's right, John. Nice. Got a new chance. This is going to keep him uh, away from that uh, bright light longer, keep him healthier Jump and newer. Up to heaven. <laughs> it's a rebounder, right? Is that what it is? Yeah. Exercise. Well, came it's, over, a, it's a rebounder. We came over next time, and John was missing. There were just a pair of shoes on the trampoline. He jumped too high. Little angel wings on. Little <laughs> angel dust. That'll on the be floor. on my tombstone. He jumped too high. He jumped too high. <laughs> <laughs> he reached too far uh, into the great unknown. Nostalgia gastric. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for coming back. Yeah, thank you after the long break, returning to the hole and hanging out with us because we missed you. And tune in next week for the next episode of Believe. Believe. Amen. Amen. Appropriate. (laughs) All right, guys, take care.